And uh, thanks for having me. Yeah, totally. Uh, well, uh, well, thank you so much for for jumping on. Uh, excited to chat about uh, all the cool stuff that you're working on. Calling in from outside of Portland, uh, trapped out the the suburbs. Uh, excited to get into your just world of making. So I know big on Lego, but uh, I bet you've built a lot of stuff along the way. So excited for for you coming on, and thank you so much for for uh, chatting with me. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me. So, uh, this, this is actually kind of funny because usually the first question starts, like, how did you start making? And almost everyone says, well, it's like when I first started, like with Lego, like that's, which I feel like that's you and then yeah. it just kept, kept going. But, uh, yeah. So what was kind of your first experience working with your hands? Yeah. Uh, I mean, the earliest I remember, I remember having like Duplo blocks, which are mm-hmm. sort of, you know, the Lego groups product line for little kids and um i but i was fairly small you know i probably had duplo when i was like two and three. Oh wow okay and i want to say my my i want to say my dad introduced me to like sort of the regular lego bricks that you imagine when i was you know four or five um and i remember i know the first like lego set that uh, I built, uh, because I've got like photographs of it somewhere. Um, and I still have some like little random pieces of it here and there. But, uh, the one that I really remember, like I have vivid memories of sitting down with my dad when I was like six years old. And, um, that was building the black seas Barracuda. And it was like the very first like big Lego pirate ship. And you, I know your listeners won't be able to see it, but you might be able to see it back here up above above me. I've got it sitting back there. So I've had that for 30 years now. Um, which is crazy to think, but, uh, yeah, those are, those are my earliest memories. And, and, uh, you know, just like going through school, if I'd had school projects or Pinewood Derby for Cub Scouts, um, my dad just always kind of, you know, I'd say like, dad, can we, can we make this or can we build this? And he, he, he never responded like, no, or like, what are you talking about? He always responded with like, well, let's get out a piece of paper and a pencil and start drawing it and start imagining how we might do it. And so yeah. he just always made me believe that uh, that I could build anything and that anything was possible. So that's cool. Those are cool. those those are some of my earliest memories. Yeah. So uh, in high school, then, um, like, were you still into building or kind of like what what group of folks did you kind of fall into? Man, high school was crazy because I was, um, I was, I was in, man, I played accordion in the marching band and we like went and, you know, had field shows in one state, the state marching band competition that year. And, and I was in choir and I was in ASB leadership and I was, uh, you know, I had friends that were Star Trek nerds and I had these other friends who we decided we wanted to build uh, proton packs and be Ghostbusters for Halloween. And so like that was a pretty significant like kind of making experience that I had with with these buddies in high school. And we just collected junk from, you know, the garbage or the secondhand store or, you know, literally we, we like I remember like not breaking in, but I'm sure we weren't supposed to be there. Like buildings that were being torn down. There was this old, like, um, this old sort of general store, a giant concrete building that was being torn down when we were building these proton packs. And we literally like trespassed. Don't do this. Uh, but we, (laughs) we trespassed onto this building that was being torn down and, and, uh, and we like rummaged around for just like bits of junk that we could use on our on our Ghostbusters proton packs. Um, but uh, you know, and and I built like oh, just all kinds of stuff. Um, my dad and I built this time machine that was like we would use in like these little skits at church and. It was like, uh, you know, you'd, you'd fire up the time machine and things would spin and lights would flash. And it, and the, it was sort of like that thing from uh, Family Matters where, you know, Steve Urkel would go in yeah. and come out, Stefan Raquel. Raquel. But it yeah. was like, 
it was like bringing bringing people from the past into the into the present and we we built that in our garage and it i think he just threw it out like two years ago um but uh you know and and cars that would run off of mouse traps and just uh you know found object art junk out of or you know what gold out of someone's garbage but anyway um <laughs> sorry that was a lot but no that's good that's yeah good. so in high school like yeah it was really just like we had my my folks property we had a couple outbuildings and we had a my room was in the basement but we also had an unfinished room in the basement where the, i just had like a workbench and uh, a bunch of my dad's tools and and i would just tinker you know and i would try to build you know i remember one time I, I took an old rotary phone and i figured out how to hook it up to 110 so that i could plug it into the outlet with a with a button and just like make it ring whenever i wanted to and i think we used that as like a functional prop on us on stage for some play we did or whatever but anyway that's fine that's fine so uh it sounds like almost the cosplay type stuff even before i guess it was really called cos cosplay so just making like the proton packs and all, all that kind of stuff and then just just stuff to keep you interested in working with your hands it sounds like you did a bunch of different things so you weren't just kind of stuck within one medium yeah that's true and you know that's i i didn't know the word cosplay back then but i was always you know any opportunity i had to create a costume for halloween or for uh you know spirit week at school or whatever um i love doing that and uh you know my mom taught me a little bit about sewing my dad obviously taught me a lot about woodworking and kind of machinery and stuff like that and um and and then you know the other thing is like I didn't really know the word like mixed media uh, until just a few years ago. And, and I, 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 you know, that is a great term, I think for the kind of stuff I did for a long time. Um, but you know, and in some, in some cases, you know, I've always sort of considered myself an artist, but you know, doing things that not everybody considers art. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So what, uh, what was after high school for you? Uh, after high school, I went to college and, um, I didn't do it's, you know, in, in, in college, I really discovered like video editing. Um, mm. and I, it was actually, I got my, my start with video editing right at the end of high school. We didn't have a video department, but we just had like a few guys who were interested in it. And like, you know, one of their dads invested in like Adobe Premiere back then. And, and we just kind of started dabbling in that stuff. And so then when I went to college, I went to a very small school, a uh, very small college here in Portland. And I was one of the only guys in the entire college that really knew how to do video editing. And um, so I kind of became like the video guy. And so then the the bit of like sort of making, you know, physical objects was often to sort of support something that I was creating, you know, for video. Um, so I would build props for dumb little movies that I made or, you know, I, I remember, you know, what setting up a bunch of PVC pipe for some kind of prop I was building. And I'm just like outside the dorms. And I went out to like the street side of the dorms and set up all this PVC pipe and like sp spray painted it black in the grass. Yeah. And I sort of had this this sense in my head that like if the dorm director came out here and saw me spray painting all this pvc pipe in the grass like i'm i might get told i need to not do this here right, right. but uh i didn't care and i just did it anyway i can't remember that. it's for like some like jail cell or something like that for for some some random movie i was making and um and then uh i i got married did a lot of music in, in okay. college and I met my wife through music and we've done music. Um, we've had, you know, a few different music projects over the years, but, um, you know, I think it was, uh, I, I, I did it for a while. I did education for a while and then I sort of landed back in that video production world and it was, uh, it was, this we had this office at this video production house i worked at and on my lunch break i would walk down to this game store and it was the kind of place where you know people would go to play dungeons and dragons or mm -hmm. you know you could pick up just whatever the latest milton bradley kind of family board games were but they also had 
this table full of loose used Lego pieces. Okay. And you could just fill up a bag with whatever you wanted and pay for the size bag you wanted. And so I would walk down there on my lunch break and dig through dig through uh, that table and just, you know, was very interested in seeing like what what were the new Lego pieces that they had produced since I was a kid and and uh, I would buy a little bag and take it back to my desk and tinker when I needed sort of like some sort of creative, you know, uh, like if I hit a creative roadblock on a video, I'd just stop and, and tinker with Lego pieces. And then when we moved out of that office, those pieces that I had accumulated going down there on lunch breaks, um, I, I brought all those pieces home. And that sort of was essentially the beginning of like my home Lego parts library right um and then i started you know experimenting with what kind of stuff can i build out of this and uh around the same time discovered that there's sort of this whole world of lego fans and joined a club here in portland and started going to the local convention and man it just blew up after that so so for people that may not be familiar with the lego fandom and that world like how do you describe it to people that just don't have context to it like how how big how like intense not intense but like how into it like do some people get well i'd say some people get as into it as you can be into anything um so this this year i'll just talk a little bit about like the the club and the convention that that I know here locally, and then you can okay. sort of extrapolate that out to like, you know, most major cities. I think would probably have some presence, uh, you know, similar to what I'm about to describe. So uh, we have a it's what's called a Lego user group. So shortened, that's Lug, and it's a uh, a lot of Lego user groups are recognized by the Lego group by Lego, the company. And, um, so we here in Portland, our lug is a recognized Lego user group. So we have just a, a small, but somewhat official relationship with Lego, the company. And, um, so we meet once a month and we just like, we'll do build challenges or people will bring stuff for show and tell and kind of our representative. We have one representative that is that guy who sort of gets official information from Lego and, uh, he'll kind of disseminate that information at those meetings. Um, and then we just kind of like get excited about what things, you know, what little local events we might show our models at or, or whatever. And we just kind of have fun together. Um, and it, here in Portland, that lug meeting will tend to be between like on a low month, we might be 30 or 40 on a high month. We might be 70 or 80. Hmm. Um, and then once a year we have a Lego, con uh, we have a Lego fan convention here in Portland. And this year there were 500 builders displaying at the convention Oh wow! and uh, 12, 12,000 people from the public visited on a Saturday and Sunday to come see the stuff. That's crazy. Um, so yeah, and this was, this was the biggest year we've ever had for that convention. We've been up to 10,000 in, in past years, uh, 10,000 public attendees. Um, and, and so what happened for me and what you'll hear many people who are really into the fandom describe is a lot of times people will go to that as a public attendee just to kind of like, I don't know, it's something to do this weekend. We can go look at Lego, you know, and, and a lot of times people will f think that's interesting for themselves or they'll think it's interesting for their kids and then they go and they see it. And, um, and so that's what I did. And I went for like three years to the, to the thing where you just, you know, you pay 10 bucks, you get in for the day and, and you go look around. Um, and then it was like, after about three years of that, I realized, you know, I want to do this. And the people who are doing this are just normal people like me. They're just, you know, putting more of their time and energy into this hobby. Um, so then I kind of, you know, crossed over into the fandom, I guess. Right. Um, and you know, some people, some people, this is all they do. <laughs> you know, they, 
they just buy Lego sets and they, and they, you know, buy, there's a whole world of buying and selling parts uh-huh. online. Um, so, you know, people who build giant things and need like a ton of the same Lego elements, most of those people don't get those parts by buying sets off the shelves. Right. Most of those people get those parts by either, you know, like buying giant collections of used Lego from people who are done with their Lego. A lot of times, like, you know, a 12 year old kid might decide they want to sell all their Lego so they, they can buy a new TV or something. Um, and, uh, or there's a site called Bricklink and there's other sites like that where, you know, people all over the world run little businesses by buying Lego sets and parting them out and selling the parts individually. Um, so yeah, it's this whole, it's a whole crazy thing. I'm sorry. You, you could, you can ask me about that and I could almost talk about it all day long. Uh, but anyway, no, that's, that's great. So, uh, in terms of, so I guess the, what I compare it to is like you mentioned Star Wars a little bit earlier. And so like every, every year, I guess now they do like a big Star Wars celebration as like their big massive convention. Mm-hmm. Is there that same thing in the Lego world? Like one big convention that everyone comes together or is it still really kind of the different areas with different, uh, uh, Lego user groups? Well, yeah, there's a, so there's a couple things that happen is, um, you know, they're all over the place. Um, the, the two really big ones in the United States are, uh, there's brick world in Chicago and brick fair, Virginia. Um, and, uh, those, those just happen to be the two largest ones. I think they've been running for a, a while. And, um, and so a lot of people go to those. So if you're going to have people traveling from far away, typically, you know, you might see a lot of those people at, at those ones. Um, but the one that I sort of think, you know, the further you sort of dive into the fandom, the, the more you might sort of be aware of this and it's called Scarebeck and it's in, uh, it's in Denmark. So the headquarters of Lego is in Billund, Denmark and, um, Scarebeck, Denmark is not far from there and they've been doing a, a Lego convention there each fall and that has kind of become the one that like super fans want to try to get to because it's the closest to the headquarters so like if you're going to travel you know if you're from some other part of the world and you're going to travel to europe then you can you can go to a great convention and you can visit the headquarters um but it's not it's not necessarily the largest convention it's just the one that probably gets the the biggest variety of people from all around the world uh and i have not i have been to bill in denmark but i have not been to the scarebeck fan weekend yet gotcha gotcha so and so you're sitting in your uh your shop and when I, especially when I watched it, like you mentioned, like the people that are building these massive things, like I feel like they just have rows and rows and rows, like all organized, super crazy. But it sounds like if you, even if you have an idea, there's ways you can source the bricks to get them specifically for your projects. So like you personally, has it just been years of just kind of building up your inventory or like, are you constantly kind of like buying new ones for new projects and selling ones you don't need? Or what's that kind of like for you? Uh, yeah, it's a combination of all of that. I, you know, I think just, you know, what I have here on hand is not necessarily as organized as some people get. Um, I, I tend to organize my brick into pretty broad categories. Some people get very granular in how they sort. Um, and, uh, I don't do that, but, but, you know, what I have here largely represents, you know, buying, um, bags from stores similar to the one that I described earlier where you can go in and you can select your parts from a big, uh, uh, table and put them in a bag. Um, or, you know, the Lego brand stores have what's called the pick a brick wall. So you can go in there and you can fill up these cups with different elements that they have on the wall there. Um, yeah. And then like buying, buying old Lego collections from yard sales or, or thrift shops or, um, you know, people on, various online marketplaces that, you know, want to sell a lot of Lego at one time. And that's, you, that's generally a pretty good way to pretty affordable way to do it. 
I mean, you have to drop a lot of money at one time, but you get a lot for what you pay because, you know, they're just, they're trying to liquidate, right, in, right. in that situation. Um, yeah, and so then a lot of times if I have something I want to build – you know, it depends. If I'm just building for me, if I'm building something that I want to show, um, I'll just build it however I need to build it to utilize the parts that I have on hand as as well as possible. Um, I just finished a commission for a company and it, it, you know, they really like they gave me the specs for their building. Basically, I built a replica of a of a popular food chain restaurant that you would you would know if I was allowed to tell you. Um, but, uh, so it had to look exactly the way they wanted it, you know? Um, so I did have to go online and make some parts purchases because I didn't have enough of what, you know, I needed to make this thing look just like my client wanted. Um, so that, you know, so I do both. Um, and it's, you know, it's fun to just look, you know, I think, I think people out there that collect anything can understand, sort of like how fun it is to go and, and find things that you maybe have never had or, or, you know, find, uh, <laughs> when you find enough, you know, when you need like a certain number of a thing and you go out and you like are miraculously able to find enough of them, you know, that's, that can be fun, but yeah, that's cool. How many, I'm sure you get this question like a bit. How many bricks do you think you have currently? Yeah, I was just telling somebody that yesterday. It's 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 hard for me to know. I I think um, like sitting in here right now, individual Lego elements, a hundred thousand would be a fairly reasonable estimate. Um, okay. it, it it could be more than that. I'm 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 bad at gauging that <laughs> those kinds of quantities, but you know, I'm just thinking about like each different type that I have hundred thousand, maybe, maybe 200,000 somewhere in there. Those that's, that's my estimate. <laughs> that's crazy. So, uh, so you mentioned and a, a lot of them are very, very small. Right, 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 right. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. No, you're, you're, you're totally fine. So you'd mentioned, um, commissions, which, uh, I didn't even realize, I guess that's, that is a whole nother world, uh, where, like folks get paid to build Lego for, especially you mentioned like companies and imagine like collectors and stuff too. Like, is that something that has happened more recently or has that always been something kind of out there where folks will want something crazy and they'll commission folks that know how to build it to make it for them? I think it's, um, I think it's becoming a bit more common. Okay. I have not been, you know, I'm really, I'm really just getting started in, in that world. Um, I would imagine that there are people who have been doing it for 20 years, but maybe, you know, maybe 20 years ago, there were literally only a handful of people in the world doing it. Um, now, you know, there's probably, uh, I don't know. It's, I, I have no idea how to guess that. Like how many people in the world have been paid to, to do, there's probably thousands of people in the world that have been paid in one way or another to build something out of Lego for a client. Um, but yeah, you know, I just think it's one of those things that like so many people, like you said, so many of your, your guests say that that's where they started making with their hands was Lego. So, so many people experienced it in one way or another as a, as a child or as an adult. And, um, and it's not, you know, if you have a company and they're doing a trade show and and you're the only company on the floor that has like a model of your this, I don't know if this is a good example or not, but you're the only company on the show that on the floor that has a, a model of your product built out of Lego, then like that gives people right, yeah, who may not have connected to your product an in, in, an easy entry point for like connecting to your product, right? Like, yeah. oh, I, you know, oh, look, that's made out of Lego. I, I loved Lego as a kid or whatever. And um, so anyway, so it, it exists. It's out there. Um, I, It's funny and enjoyable to me that it's something I can do from time to time. So, yeah. Yeah. So what is your, your day job then currently? Are you still doing video work? 
I do video production now, but almost all of the video production I do now is related to the Lego fandom in one way or another. Um, so I have my own YouTube channel and that is, you know, a stream of income. I have, uh, uh, another YouTube channel that is much larger than mine that I do some work for. Um, and, uh, so I often will get like, um, you know, brand deals and stuff through them. Um, and then, uh, let's see, I, I have been for the last couple of years an assistant teacher at my daughter's preschool, but we've just been, shut down for the rest of the year and uh she'll go to elementary school next year so i imagine that that piece of what i do will change moving forward um so right now it's really i mean it all is just kind of freelancey type stuff right that has to do with the, the lego fan community and sometimes it's building models and sometimes it's creating videos so so oliver all of those and so yeah. the other the other channel that's beyond the brick right that you've done some stuff with yeah yeah yep how, yep. how did you uh, get connected with them? Well, it's crazy. Uh, you know, I actually got connected with them not long after I, uh, not long after I started kind of getting into the Lego fan community, and I think it's really because of them. It's because of them that I've had almost all of the ridiculous opportunities in the Lego fandom that I have. Um, so they're they're awesome. Uh, but we basically met at you know I knew who they were from YouTube, and we met at a Lego convention, and I was displaying there, and we just talked about YouTube, and we, we kind of geeked out about YouTube. And it was like, you know, I think it was an opportunity for them to see, to like make a connection with someone outside of, or with someone in a Lego convention, but connecting on an interest other than Lego, um, you know, which happens. That's sort of what we do. You know, you, you go to a, um, I imagine you go like Maker Faire and stuff like that. Yeah, totally. You know, I imagine you go to those things and on some level, everyone's sort of there for the same reason, but then you kind of find among those people like, you know, different layers of, of shared common interests, right? So that's that's how that happened with the guys at Beyond the Brick. And we just kind of, you know, we talked about the Vlog Brothers, and we talked about, um, you know, some of our other favorite YouTubers and we just kind of geeked out on YouTube for a little while in the middle of this uh, Lego convention. And then they went and found my channel and they appreciated what I was doing there. And I, I think they sort of saw the combination of like, you know, this is a guy who can build and he can, you know, be on, you know, be a personality on camera and he can edit the videos. So it was just a good fit for, you know, them to kind of send some work my way, if yeah. you will. Yeah. Yeah. So I don't realize they do, um, uh, for some reason, I was thinking they were just like centrally located. But so do they work with kind of fixed all over, uh, doing stuff on the contract side of things, or like are, is their channel just is it? It's a little bit bigger than just like one location. Well, they so uh, they're based in Indiana, right? And John and Josh are the brothers that run that video or that run that YouTube channel, and um. They're, you know, they are headquartered where they live in Indiana, but they spend so much time on the road going all around the world to Lego conventions. And that's, you know, primarily their content is interviews with builders at Lego conventions. Gotcha. Um, so, so that's how they've, they've got content all over the place. And, you know, that's why they were at the convention here in Portland the year that I met them. And, um, and they've, there's, you know, I'd say there's probably half a dozen, what I, we call ourselves contributors, I guess, to beyond the brick. And there's, you know, there's, there's probably like a half a dozen of us and we just are offered projects when they come available. Um, and sometimes that includes, you know, making a trip to an event that John and Josh can't get to, or sometimes it's just, you know, receiving a product at our homes, our home studios and, and, uh, you know, reviewing them and creating some content, or sometimes it's more like a commission build. So gotcha. that's cool. So, uh, the one thing I definitely wanted to ask you, uh, and if people aren't familiar, even with beyond the brick, 
they probably have seen you on Lego Masters. And so how did you even sure. how did you even hear about the show? And like so we've we've had some folks that have been on uh making it. So on NBC Yeah, uh, yeah. The craft the crafting show. I actually had uh the guy that won it two years ago on but uh like just the casting process for that, like was it did you just see an open entry and decided just to put your name in the hat? Yeah, so I actually, um, I I actually applied for making it the f- the first season oh, cool. when it was it, you know the it was under the name of uh, the Handmade Project before yeah. it got renamed Making It and and uh, I you know I made it through a couple rounds of um, of the audition process for that first season of Making It because you know I I make other things and I think they were interested and I I was able to show them a lot you know and but. Uh, so, you know, I, I had so many Lego models that I wanted to submit when I was submit, you know, gathering all the images uh, for right. applying for making it, uh, that I thought, you know, there just needs to be a, a Lego version of this show. And eventually there was, um, another piece of the story is I had a friend who was on a, a TBS show called King of the Nerds. Hmm. Um, and she won season two. So my, my friend from high school, Kayla won season two of King of the Nerds. And, uh, so she was able to kind of like all along, give me sort of some, uh, advice on, on, you know, what casting directors are looking for, for this type of show. Um, and so I had talked to her about King of the Nerds, I had, which I never actually applied for, but I talked to her about making it. And then I, I was, uh, you know, I'd think about this time last year, she sent me a message, you know, in like spring of 2019 and said, Hey Boone, I've just heard some rumblings that Lego Masters is coming to the United States. She's like, I don't know anything about it, but you're going to want to keep your ears open because it's coming. And I was like, oh, sweet. Uh, and then I went to, um, I went to San Diego Comic Con in July of 2019, and I was sitting in the audience of a a Lego digital media forum presentation. Uh, so it was guys there that animate for, um, the Lego Jurassic park series and the Lego Ninjago series and some of these other properties. And they were just talking about what's coming and what's new. And, and, uh, Joshua Hanlon from beyond the brick was actually the moderator of that panel at, at SDCC. And, uh, and at the end of the panel, they announced that Lego Masters is coming to the United States. Fox has just signed on to uh, be the network for the show. And by the way, the website to apply is live now. Oh wow! And 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 that was that was the end of the panel. Um, right. And uh, I, so I literally like I stood up and I walked out of the panel room, and I called Mark. Uh, who you, who's my partner on the show. And I said, Hey, you want to apply for Lego masters? And, uh, and we did. Um, and we actually, you know, it was, it was just like an open. So I, it was, it was the exact, like the beginning of the process was exactly the same as making it. So for your, your, your guests who went through that process or for any of your listeners who are familiar with that, um, it, you know, it's ba- pretty much exactly the same casting product process. They're just looking for people who do a slightly different thing. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and, 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 you know, it's a pretty in depth application. So we, you know, we're kind of looking at it and gathering stuff, gathering a lot of photos and some video together for that application for a couple weeks. And during that time, uh, casting producers actually reached out to us on Instagram to sort of like drum up some interest, be like, Hey, you know, we like what you guys build. Are you interested in applying? So they did that for a lot of people. I think they, you know, I wouldn't be surprised if they reached out to some, some hundreds or thousands of people. And I, and I heard that, I don't know if this is true, but I've heard that the number of people that applied was like 11,000. Um, oh gosh. And, 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 and there were about 60, there were about 60 people. So that'd be like 30 teams, at, at casting finals in, at the beginning of October. And then, about, you know, 10 teams went down for the show at the beginning of, uh, the beginning of November. Were the casting finals, is that in person or is that just another round of interviews? 
that was the first piece of yeah so it was the last round of casting you know we had we had already done i guess the first bit would be like um submitting your form or having a phone call um and uh and then the next was like a series of Skype interviews. And so we did a, we did a few rounds of Skype interviews and then, yeah, then it was like casting finals. They flew us down to LA and we spent a weekend at a hotel near the airport and we had a couple of build challenges. That was a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, I saw like, um, the one person I knew before all of this was uh, Samuel Hatmaker. Um, and uh, the moment I walked into the hotel for casting finals, he saw me from across the the lobby and ran over and gave me a hug because we had we had met before and cool. we were all incredibly nervous, you know. Yeah. But uh, and then of course when we flew down for the show, we recognized some of the people that we had seen at casting finals. So that's cool. Yeah, it was wild. Was it always a team competition? Like, was it a like you and Mark? application together or was it a separate kind of application process and you guys got put together the application was for teams of two okay so mark and i applied with one application that included both of us um but because there were casting people reaching out to individuals you know most most of those most of the people that were reached out to by individually because a casting director saw their Instagram or saw their YouTube and liked their stuff and liked their personality. Um, most of those people were encouraged to find a partner Got it. Okay. to audition with. Um, but some of those people, you know, either they found a partner that didn't work out for one reason or another, or, um, or they were just individuals who the casting department liked enough that they brought them as far as casting finals, you know, as an individual and then put them with somebody. So there's two teams on the show um, and it's, it's Sam and Jessica and Aaron and Christian. Those two teams on the show were put together and uh, they were all people who were applying and, and like Sam and Sam and Christian and Aaron all had, other teammates somewhere in the casting process that for one reason and for one reason or another couldn't do the show when it came down to it or, um, casting, you know, wanted some other options. Um, but, uh, but yeah, uh, the rest of us, the rest of the teams, you know, there's a couple married, couple married couples in there, a couple of teams of friends. I think Mel and Jermaine, had only met online, but they'd been following each other for a while. So they applied together cool. and they got on together, but they did, they had never met face to face before Lego masters. Um, yeah, Manny and Nestor were father and son. I'm trying to think that, you know, it's just kind of most, most of the people had some kind of relationship before the show. Yeah. What was the most kind of un- un- unexpected part of just the, the whole process of being, on the show for you? Unexpected part. Um, yeah, let's see. What was the most unexpected part? Uh, y- you know, one of the interesting things was we didn't have to really do anything ourselves. <laughs> For, okay. What do you, mean? you know, for the, for the, for the time we were there, like, uh, of course everything you see on camera, like we're working very hard oh, and, gotcha, and doing, gotcha. right, but right. like, but like off, off camera, we like, if we, if we needed something like some production assistant would just like show up with it, yeah. you know, yeah, yeah. a few, a few minutes later, that was weird. Um, uh, we didn't, Oh, the, I guess the clock, you know, I've, I've been in little situations where we had to build on a clock before, um, just at conventions, you know, like fun games where you're, you're trying to do a challenge in a certain amount of time, but the clock was really like the most unbelievable 
difference between yeah. building at home and building in the Lego Masters competition because it was just it was just crazy. It was, you know, it was time would fly by. You'd look up there and it's so much pressure. Yeah. Um, and so that was that was unexpected. I you know, we knew of course we knew that that was going to be an element challenge you know for this competition but we had no way of anticipating how it was going to feel you know yeah um that's one of the biggest you know for people who if there's a season two for people who want to apply that's one of the biggest things i tell them is like practice building something you know to the clock and and the thing is is you know in a competition setting we're always trying to build you know, 110% more than we can right. actually accomplish during, during that amount of time. Um, so people, you know, people will ask like, are you, are you actually building right up to the last second or is that like TV drama? And really in almost every challenge, we are building right up until the last second because we're trying to accomplish, you know, like I said, we're trying to accomplish more right, right. than any other team. Like, is it possible in six hours for us to accomplish more than any other team in this room can accomplish in six hours? And, and you know, okay. that's the way it was. So it's, it's crazy. I, I, I can't, I can't relate it to another experience I've had in my life. It's yeah, uh, it's wild. Yeah. Yeah, that was. I wanted to ask you if the tension was <clears throat> was real, and it sounds like it was, especially with the clock. How much faster would you say you built on the clock on the show versus like you're doing the the work just in your shop? Yeah, well, that's. I would say, I would definitely say faster. I don't know how to quantify it, right. but um, but one of the main differences is if I'm working in my shop and. You know, a lot of what I do when I'm building is trial and error, mm -hmm. and I might I might put a little piece of a model together and and look at it and go, well, what do I think about that? Like, should I try some different combinations of of other things that I haven't tried to maybe make that better than it is? And um, I feel like we didn't have time to do that. You know, we we never felt like we had time to build something. And, and stand back and ask ourselves if it was good or not. You know what I mean? It almost always felt like if we had spent the time building it, we had to move on, you know, because that time was gone and that thing was already built. And, and so it always felt like a thing that's built is better than a thing that's not built um, when we've already used some time. So, so that's an interesting piece of it. Um, so, you know, it, we definitely... We definitely like trusted our gut and and built and then like moved on and felt good about things much faster than I would at home. Because, um, you know, at home I have all the time in the world. Mm -hmm. If I want to build something for the convention, I can start three months before the convention. Or, um, or if I'm just building something for myself, it can literally take as long as I want. Um, you know, so I can think a lot about, well, what am I going to use here? Or what colors should this be? And let me try this. And if it doesn't work out, then I can take it apart and do it again and do it differently. But we really felt like we had too much pressure on the show to, to do that. Yeah, yeah. In terms of, I guess, the Hollywood aspect of it, especially the folks there like Will Arnett and then even like the celebrity, like the guest host or like R2-D2 and C-3PO walking in, like was that all a surprise or like those reactions that you guys had, like, were they, uh, like in the moment you're like, Oh shoot, that's someone I had no, no idea that would they'd be on the show walking in while we're building. Yeah. Well, it was, it was all, they, they kept as much secret as they possibly could. Um, so we, we did know that Will Arnett was the host. I think they announced that within like our first two days there. So our, oh. our first day there was like, um, our first day there was just like wardrobe tests. And our second day was just sort of out in different parts of town, taping stuff with our partners, you know, for like slow-mo kind of background footage while we're doing our, um, you know, like, uh, what do they call those? Uh, background, I think maybe background packages where okay. it's sort of int introducing the teams to the right. audience. And so we just had a day of like shooting random, you know, buddies running around the town kind of <laughs> shots. 
Um, and each team did that in a slightly different way. Um, but, uh, so we, we didn't start, we didn't start a challenge until like everybody's third day, uh, there. And so, you know, that I suppose was Will's first day on set with us, but it was sometime in, in the, that first or second day that we discovered via, you know, announcements online that Will Arnett had been, you know, uh, uh, had agreed to be the host yeah. for Lego masters. Um, so we weren't like extremely in- excited. It wasn't a surprise to us when we saw him, but when you see us see him for the first time, it is the first time we're seeing him. Right. And that was very exciting, you know? Yeah. Um, and, and it's also, we're like taking in like this room, this incredible set that they built to like, look like it was made out of Lego in, in like Lego colors. And, and then there's just this giant, you know, part of the room that's full of bins of Lego pieces and, um, and the lights, the giant lights on the ceiling look like the bottom side of Lego bricks. Uh, so, you know, we're taking in all of that at the same time and, and we're having those reactions and, and it's, you know, um, that was, but you know, the one, the Will Arnett was the one time we weren't surprised. I think with every other guest that came on the show, we were surprised and you, you saw us having surprised reactions because we really yeah. were seeing them for the first time and we didn't know who was coming. Um, and, and then the big one for me was probably, um, Terry Cruz. And the weird thing about that was is I had speculated that Terry might be the host of this show because uh, okay. a couple a, a couple weeks before we went down, um, Terry Crews, I follow him because my wife and I love uh, Brooklyn Nine Nine, yeah, and yeah. he's a hilarious, hilarious guy, and I've seen him in all kinds of things and, over the years, and um, and uh, he had posted a picture of a big, um like star Wars tie fighter made out of Lego uh, that he had sort of like in his, you know, he had it in a display case somewhere at his house and, um, he seemed super excited about it. And I was like, Oh, okay, this guy's funny. He sort of seems like the tier of celebrity that they might get for a, uh, for a reality TV show host. And, and he's posting about Lego on his Instagram. So he was really like my biggest speculation for, for, uh, being the host. And, and, and I had talked about that before he appeared. And so then I was, when he burst through the wall, I was blown away to see him cause I love him as an actor and a comedian. And, and I, it was also just shocking <laughs> that I had, that I had, you know, spoken about right, Terry right. Crews being on the show. And then suddenly he was, yeah, yeah. um, and so I was just flabbergasted. So you see that, you know, and I'm, I'm, uh, I tend to wear my emotions on my sleeve anyway. So I, you know, I'm, I'm, uh, prone to, to big reactions. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, just in day to day life. Uh, and that's probably, you know, probably one of the reasons I made it on the show is, uh, they, they were able to see that I had something in my personality that would make me fun to watch. But, um, but anyway, uh, yeah. So what you see is real. I mean, I'm not. I won't say that it's not a. They're creating a scenario where all that stuff is heightened, right? Right. right. Um, but but I wouldn't say any of it's fake. You know. So. Yeah. 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 There that <laughs> that reaction we were coming through. I was like, "There's no way that 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 was that was staged." When they cut to you and you're just losing it, and I'm like, "This is this is incredible." So it uh, it, was, it was cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we had no idea. Oh, and I'll show you. I don't. Who 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 gets to see this? Just you and a few people watching on. Well, so I'll uh, I'll actually post it to my YouTube channel as well, so anybody can can see it if they if they're just listening right now, they can they can come back in. This is a piece of the styrofoam wall that Terry Crews bursted <laughs> through. That's awesome. He came in on this on that episode. So yeah, there yeah. you go. Just, just a little take- treat, a little treat for the people that watch the YouTube channel. Did you just take it? Uh, yeah, every, pretty much anything that was like one time use like that, um, ended up by the dumpster Oh, cool! Right at the end of the day. Um, so that was sitting out there and it, so those were the pieces, you know, I, I think that the, the pieces that exploded out of the wall when he came through and just ended up right in the dumpster, but that 
four by eight, you know, I want to say it's probably like a, maybe it was bigger than that. It, it might've been like a six by 12 section of uh-huh. wall, um, you know, with a hole, a Terry Crews shaped hole burst through it was sitting by the dumpster for a couple days. And, uh, a few of us just pulled pieces off of it. Um, but like, yeah, like the, uh, the big, um, the big like Pinewood Derby track from uh-huh. the bridge, uh, or the bridge episode and we did the Pinewood Derby cars that when we walked into that episode, it was, it was massive and it was all made out of wood and it was awesome. And then we did that challenge and two hours after we finished that part of the challenge, the entire Pinewood Derby track was like destroyed and in the dumpster. It was crazy. Yeah. So yeah, that's, <laughs> uh, so yeah, somebody it's it's somebody's job just to build that stuff that's going to get dro- destroyed like as soon yeah. as the cameras stop rolling. I know. I know. So uh, kind of the, the last thing I wanted to, to ask you. So the finale is tomorrow at the time of this recording, but people will know by the time this comes out. But in terms of just like you uh, being recognized, I know it seems like you've gotten several interview requests because of the show. Like, are things changed for you as a result of just being on a pretty popular tv show but still getting to do lego and all that kind of stuff yeah things have changed um and it it's not like it's not like a huge crazy change because i've been you know i've been working on this stuff and been trying to do this stuff for a number of years and so like you know my youtube channel is certainly seeing more growth and um, viewership than it did before the show, um, and 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 so that's good. But you know, it's also like I had, you know, I've had content there for a number of years, so it's sort of like this. It, it's hard for me to know how much of my growth right now is possible just because of the show and how much is possible because of like sort of my backlog of stuff. I, you know, um, so it's not like a huge difference. It's not like I created a YouTube channel yesterday and now I have a a, a million followers, you know, that's, that didn't happen. Right. Um, but it has been cool to get, uh, you know, the, the kind of feedback that I've gotten from, from parents and families and, and young people, you know, about how we have inspired them to be creative and, um, or, you know, even just inspired them to get their box of Lego pieces out from when they were a kid and, and, and try putting something together. Um, and so that, you know, it's, it's really cool. And, and so, and now I don't know how much, I never know how much to talk about, you know, the current state of the world, but, um, we had to stop having viewing parties, you know, after I think week four. Um, and, uh, so now we just watch alone and, um, and, you know, I don't go out much. Um, but, uh, I went to the grocery store the other day with one of those N95 masks on my face and I still got recognized by like five different people at the grocery store. So, right. Right. Which I, I did, I, I did, I did not believe I would be recognized with a mask on, but, um, apparently a lot of people are at home watching Lego masters. So definitely, definitely. And (laughs) (laughs) so the, the last question for people that are, at home and we're all at home, but see what you guys are making and are like, I have no idea even where to start. Like, how do you, any recommendations you give for people who want to stop just building off of the kits and like kind of start making their own things Mm -hmm. or they're just kind of good routes to, to go about doing it. Yeah. Uh, a good piece of advice that my, my partner, Mark, he's, you know, Mark Crookshank is my partner from the TV show. We are the builded bearder, uh, the bearded builders. One thing he always tells people, and I think this is a good idea, is to, if you have one minifigure, um, or if you have a bunch of minifigures and you can select one that you really love or that you think has a really cool costume or is a really cool character from something you love, um, look at that minifigure and say, what would I build to go with this minifigure? And whether it's a little, you know, 8x8 or 16x16 vignette 
of, you know, the room that that figure would live in or maybe a vehicle for that figure or, or whatever it might be. Um, you know, because the, the figure, if you start thinking about it in your head, you can start to tell the story. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the most important things we learned on Lego masters was nobody else will care about what you've built if they can't look at it and start to imagine the story, the world in which it lives, you know? And, um, and so if you can do that with a minifigure and, and, uh, and then just say, what would I build for this minifigure? What do they need or where do they live? Um, and maybe that's a good way to start. Another thing I say to people is, um, just get your hands on some Lego. And, um, you know, if it's, if you have none, then go to the store and buy one set and build what the instructions say, because that's where you learn technique is, you know, from uh, the official instructions that, you know, people like me, but the ones who actually work for Lego developing these products, put you know, tons of entire departments, mm -hmm. design departments, put tons of time and energy and resources into making these things good. Right. And so, so that's, where you can learn the techniques and then take the thing apart and use the same pieces and see what you can build. That's not that thing, uh, using the same pieces and just challenge yourself. Like, okay, I just built this fire engine. Now I'm going to take the fire engine apart and I'm going to try to build a spaceship or I'm going to try to build a robot or whatever and, uh, and see what you can do. Um, those are, those are, I think, the two best pieces of advice I know for people who are trying to move from like, uh, building from the instructions to trying to build something out of their own imagination. That's cool. Well, but I appreciate, uh, you chatting and, uh, sharing a little bit of your story. It's also the story of being on the show. Uh, I definitely, I've told my wife this, uh, but I mean, you guys are a blast. We're definitely pulling for you, even though you've already one or not one, but we're pull for you tomorrow night, regardless. Uh, you guys are our favorite. What you guys are making are super, super cool. But uh, for people that want to follow along, like with the YouTube or, or Instagram, um, any good places you would send people uh, to check your stuff out? Yeah, you can find me as Boone Builds, B O O N E B U I L D S, almost anywhere. YouTube.com slash Boone Builds, Instagram at Boone Builds. Um, I'm Boone Builds on Facebook and uh, BooneBuilds.com. Um, so, you know, there's so each of those offers a, a slightly different way of engaging um, my future builds and kind of what I, my story in the, in the Lego fan community. Uh, and then Mark, my teammate on Lego Masters, is on Instagram as uh, Me Crookshank. So it's M E C R U I C K S H A N K. Uh, and you can find Mark's stuff there on Instagram. Sweet. I'll make sure I include all that links in the show notes. But man, thank you so much for, for chatting. Uh, it was definitely a, definitely a blast. Really cool what you guys are doing. Hey, thank you so much, Brandon. Really appreciate your time. Totally.